All right, so I think that we should get started. It is my pleasure to uh, introduce to you today our Bar Shop Seminar speaker, Dr. Kelly Dinley. Um, she is a professor, an associate professor at the Department of Neurology and is also affiliated with the Mitchell Center for Neurodegenerative Diseases at the University of Texas Medical Branch. Uh, she is affiliated also with uh, the Neuroscience Group um, and with a number of other um, departments. And uh, she um, is, is a neuroscientist with a focus and expertise in neurodegeneration, particularly in Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease, and has made very important contributions to the field. Uh, she received her PhD at Baylor University. Yeah, uh, oh, uh, Baylor College of Medicine. Not the religiously affiliated. <laughs> agnostic. Agnostic <laughs> is important. And then she did a, a postdoctoral, postdoctoral training with David Sweat. And, um, and then uh, she started her research program uh, that has been uh, very well funded and continuously producing uh, exciting research uh, since she started her lab. So she's going to uh, talk to us today about integrated omics to expose memory mechanisms in health and disease. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Veronica. Um, we have a common offspring that brought us together. That's Jordan Jarling here. And so he did his PhD in my lab. And then he brought Veronica and I together through logistic means. And so she and I have been talking and collaborating for, I don't know, over a year now. And it's been really nice and really fun. So thank you for the invitation. It's been really great to visit the campuses. <laughs> OK, so today. Um, I'm going to talk to you about a, a pretty big chunk of our lab, my laboratory's work, and that's using an animal model for Alzheimer's disease in a pretty restricted fashion to get at memory mechanisms. And so by interrogating what's wrong with our disease model and then intervening with hypothesized targets to improve cognition, we actually are illuminating novel mechanisms of uh, memory, it's specifically in the hippocampus. And what's, what we're, so we're going to focus on hippocampus. We're focusing on early uh, cognitive deficits in an animal model for amyloidosis. And um, this is providing us with, I think, with some interesting novel insight into how the hippocampus works to consolidate memories. So I don't need to tell you about the um, recently uh, re-evaluated um, diagnostic and staging criteria for Alzheimer's disease that was um, tackled by the NIH and the Alzheimer's Association in collaboration with um, the ADNI and the, um, many of the people that overlap these two entities at the Alzheimer's and Dementia uh, Journal, in that they defined a new stage called preclinical or pre-symptomatic, and they, um, in addition to the mild cognitive impairment in AD, and they identified specific metrics for uh, various CSF and CNS biomarkers in addition to um, neuropsychological testing to define uh, the likelihood that you are preclinical uh, due to AD or MCI due to AD or you should be diagnosed as AD. And so as you know, there's a whole um, sort of a metric checklist that allows one to uh, try to more accurately stage the, these new um, uh, as, uh, stages of the disease in order to better monitor interventions that may have disease outcome measure effects uh, as well as uh, in, allow better um, uh, mechanistic understanding of the disease process. And since I already told you we're focusing on the hippocampus, we're actually further focusing on that entorhinal cortex dentate gyrus synapse in that um, this appears to be the gateway between all of the sensory and contextual and spatial information that we're taking in on a moment-by-moment -moment basis that is then funneled into the hippocampus such that if the information contained within it is of sufficient valence or importance, then um, a memory trace is formed that has the chance of consolidating and forming a long-term memory. Okay. So just to add one more layer to the talk, uh, we, uh, I have to credit my husband who over 10 years ago 
nudged me in an Alzheimer's talk and said, there's a lot of overlap between insulin resistance and diabetes and what they're talking about with Alzheimer's. And at the time, he was in an endocrinology biotechnology firm, and I totally ignored him because he was my husband. But um, it turns out that uh, as time has gone by and you know, more and more epidemiological and, and, and mechanistic studies and observations done in animal models, it's clear now that insulin resistance is a very prominent risk factor for uh, Alzheimer's uh, uh, cognitive decline and, and risk for conversion to AD from MCI as well as developing uh, MCI. So basically insulin resistance as we consider it in the brain is basically uncoupling of the insulin receptor and its uh, downstream signaling pathways which includes ERKMAP kinase uh, which is going to become important for hippocampal plasticity that I will discuss later. Uh, in addition to its risk for diabetes, it's um, insulin resistance in general, but not necessarily diabetes. Uh, it's a sort of a, a, a gradation. Um, we become more insulin resistant as we age. And so as we age, we know that age is a risk factor for Alzheimer's. So therefore, the aging process that precludes us to insulin resistance is also adding to our risk for um, Alzheimer's disease. And we know that um, it, it increases our risk for sporadic AD as well as conversion. Now this brings us to the peroxisome proliferator activator receptor gamma. And this uh, nuclear receptor is a major therapeutic target for type 2 diabetes. There have been and still are uh, trials uh, testing the insulin sensitizing action of ligands, including pyoglitazone and rosiglitazone for PPAR gamma. Now this is a um, crystal structure of PPAR gamma in uh, uh, it's dimerization with the uh, RXR nuclear receptor, which is almost its ubiquitous um, partner in transcriptional activities. As I mentioned, it's a nuclear hormone receptor. It's, it's in the same family as estrogen and progesterone receptors. There's a lot of work on the structure function um, uh, properties of the uh, steroid receptor nuclear receptor family, which apply also to the PPARs. PPAR is... Um, Re responsible for uh, adipose tissue differentiation and adiposity, which is why PPAR gamma ligands have been associated with weight gain in diabetics that take these ligands. However, another rich source for PPAR gamma message and protein is brain, and hippocampus is one of the richest um, uh, brain regions in which this protein is expressed. As I said, it's ligand activated. There are endogenous ligands that are not well understood as to where the specificity comes from, in that um, most of these endogenous ligands have very low affinity for the receptor. They crosstalk to other uh, nuclear receptors that are related to PPAR, including RXR and LXR, but um, retinoic acid being a, a rather intriguing one. And again, um, pyoglitazone is, and rosiglitazone have structural uh, relationship to its endogenous receptors. I'm sorry, but the button's not really responding to my... Uh, something's... Oh, here we go. Okay. So the simple version of our hypothesis is that since uh, ERK and uh, PI3 kinase that um, can actually feed into ERK also, are downstream of insulin receptor signaling, as well as many other neurotransmitter receptors and growth factor receptors. Um, since ERK is downstream of this, and ERK is, is really important in the hippocampus for Cree-dependent gene transcription that is requisite for hippocampus-dependent memory consolidation, our idea was that uh, we might be able to exploit PPAR gamma uh, utilizing one of its ligands to um, bypass all of this to get to ERK and uh, drive uh, memory consolidation in an Alzheimer's animal model. We know that PPAR gamma and ERK are uh, somewhat interrelated in the periphery, but no one had ever before investigated its role in the central nervous system uh, or in memory. So the animal model we use is the TG2576 uh, mouse model that um, Karen Chow Ash uh, published back in 1996. It expresses the amyloid precursor protein that's mutated with the Swedish mutation. And we know through uh, many years of work, both from uh, some very prominent labs as well as my own, 
that the TG2576 undergoes age-dependent cognitive decline, mainly in hippocampus-dependent memory tests, but also in uh, memory tests that aren't so hippocampus-dependent, such as object recognition. What we do know is that with the onset of um, a cognitive decline is ERK dysregulation in the hippocampus. We also have unpublished evidence that there's hippocampal uh, insulin resistance as measured by intermediates of insulin receptor uh, signaling as well as the insulin receptor activa uh, activation state itself. But and interestingly, peripheral insulin resistance is not manifest in this animal until about eight months of age, which is important because we have, um, through several studies now, identified therapeutic windows based upon dinner and different interventions at different ages. And so we know what, what I'm going to be talking to you about today is rosiglitazone cognitive improvement. Um, however, we've published before that um, calcineurin inhibition at around five months of age is cognitive enhancing, but not at older ages. Metformin uh, activation of AMPK at older ages is, is improves cognitive performance, but not at younger ages. So we think we've identified very specific therapeutic windows. And if you, if you plug in the, um, the biomarker profile that I showed you on my first slide, along with the cognitive uh, phenotype of this animal, I think this is a very good animal for preclinical to MCI transition, and which is important because in humans, this allows us, again, a very good therapeutic window for uh, intervention with possible disease-modifying uh, success. Okay, so my first graduate student, Jennifer Rodriguez Rivera, discovered that um, CNS P bar gamma restores ERP dependent memory consolidation by basically. All right, something's timing out here. Treating the TG2576 uh, animal as um, though it had type 2 diabetes. Here we go. Oh, sorry. So the experimental paradigm, as <laughs> I described on my next slide, is, uh-oh, all right, here we go. Are we getting help from the booth? Uh, so the experimental paradigm that she enlisted was to uh, treat the animals with rosiglitazone. Here we go. I don't know if I... Uh, Okay, that's right. I'm so afraid I skipped too many slides. Oh, I've gotten ahead of myself. He put it on the desktop. Uh huh. So if we look at um, dentate gyrus CA3CA1, total ERK is unaltered, but phosphorylation is hyper uh, increase, which ind indicates hyperactivation compared to the littermate wild type uh, genotype. So from a plasticity standpoint, if you have hyperactivation of ERK, you're losing your dynamic range, which we postulated at the time and we still think is part of the problem with memory in this animal is that when ERK activation needs to be there, it can't go anywhere. So what it's sealing out or it really doesn't have the dynamic range it needs for uh, to properly activate CREB for the gene transcription dependent memory consolidation. Okay, before I get to the treatment paradigm, um, so we use the con con contextual and cued fear conditioning task to t probe hippocampus dependent memory because if you train the animal in a, a chamber with uh, two uh, tr uh, uh, presentations of an auditory stimulus w within which the last two seconds is a foot shock. And uh, 24 hours later, you test the animal for contextual hippocampus dependent associative learning. Uh, you put them back in the training chamber and you monitor them for five minutes. And if they remember the context in which they were sh uh, shocked, then they should freeze because uh, rodents freeze in response to threatening situations uh, if, if, through innate um, uh, defensive responses. 
to uh, in, in evaluate emotional learning, emotional associative learning that's hippocampus independent, you disguise the training chamber and you allow the animal to explore for three minutes and then you represent the auditory condition stimulus in the last three minutes of the test session and again uh, measure freezing. And I probably don't need to show you this, but um, just to give you an idea of what the impairment looks like, we have a TG2576 and a wild type mouse um, in the contextual test, in which this is the training chamber, but there's no foot shot being delivered and there's no auditory stimulus. All other conditions are the same. You notice that the wild type animal is now freezing, and then it's going to reposture to the quintessential posture, which is the extended torso, extended tail, and very little motion except for breathing. The Alzheimer's model is exploring. It's, it doesn't really recall or have the emotional recollection of um, the training session. We're probably going to get stuck here again. Okay, here we go. Now, just to show you that the emotional learning, amygdala-dependent learning, is not impaired in the TG2576 model, they exhibit normal uh, freezing to the auditory cue when it's represented in a novel context. So this is, the video is still recording, and this guy's freezing, just like you saw the wild-type animal in the contextual test. So the animals have proper emotional learning. They just don't remember the context or the spatial cues uh, in the, in the, in the tra from the training chamber during the training session. So Jennifer utilized this test as a, as a rapid way to evaluate hippocampal function in our um, TGs, wild types, with and without rosiglitazone treatment. So she uh, basically treated the animals for one month with uh, rosiglitazone, and then she tested them. She actually did this experiment three times. And as I alluded to in one of my interest slides, she, she treated animals from four to five months, eight to nine months, and then 12 to 13 months. And the only time that it really worked was uh, in the eight to nine month treated animals, so therefore defining the PPAR gamma uh, therapeutic window. As you can see here, uh, rosiglitazone did not, did not improve wild type performance. The PPAR gamma selective and irreversible antagonist GW9662 did not reverse that performance. Uh, TGs untreated are impaired in the contextual test, and rosiglitazone reversed that. But then GW again, uh, ICV injected. Uh, four hours prior to the training session obliterated the, the positive effect of the PPAR gamma agonism, suggesting that CNS, PPAR gamma, is responsible for the effect of the rosiglitazone treatment on hippocampus um, uh, memory. So we wanted to get at what's going on. So we know that PPAR gamma is a transcription factor. So we know that if we're activating it for a month, we're changing the genomic and proteomic landscape. And so in collaboration with my husband, Larry Denner, <coughs> we performed a series of uh, omics studies to try to get at um, what are the relevant uh, messages and proteins that are relevant to improving uh, hippocampal function. So the idea is that things that are unique to the untreated or um, common to the treated and untreated are not of interest, and those that are um, left from this subtractive approach <coughs> are possibly candidates for um, cognitive enhancement. So when we took the dentate gyrus and performed qPCR on a array that we designed ourselves based upon like just sort of post hoc uh, idea that these must be important for plasticity, you know, from the literature, they're important for plasticity, including Krebs binding protein, PPAR, <clears throat> we included just to see um, target engagement outcome measure possibly, and then ERK. In addition to several other structural synaptic and um, uh, regulatory proteins that have been <clears throat> published upon as being instrumental in hippocampus plasticity. So we found, uh, interestingly, that um, ERK message is up, PPAR message is up, so rosiglitazone is doing something in the TG2576 animals. <coughs> and then interestingly, CREB, which is a binding partner, um, CREB binding protein, which is a transcriptional binding partner for CREB, was also increased with uh, rosiglitazone treatment. <coughs> 
What we didn't do prior, when we set up the array, was evaluate the promoter um, regulatory elements in these genes that we selected. And so, in a somewhat, um, you know, not that, well, in, in sort of a serendipitous manner, when we went in to identify what's regulating the um, expression of all these genes in our array, we found that, you know, not only were there a bunch of PPAR response element containing genes, but the vast majority of our hits were those that contained both PPAR response elements and cyclic A and P response elements that are the consensus sequence for attracting CREB and CREB binding protein for gene transcription. Another minor component was those that were only CRE containing and then some that were neither, suggesting that there's some kind of crosstalk here between the ERK CREB pathway and PPAR gamma. So uh, we took this a step further, and Larry did quantitative mass spectrometry um, by doing differential oxygen labeling of triptychly digested peptides so that you shift the mass of your peptides by about four Daltons when uh, you compare those that are heavy water labeled versus uh, regular water labeled. And by mixing the peptides in a stoichiometric manner, enriching for either phospho or non-phospho, uh, and then further fractionating by size, he was able to get high resolution uh, database of the proteins that were differentially regulated between our untreated and our treated TG2576. This is just a flow chart of who did what and some of the publications that led to this technology as well as um, its analysis. But once we looked at our <clears throat> peptide list, we really didn't get a huge number of proteins that were statistically significantly changed, which is good because if you get a huge number, then you may not have that much specificity. But what we found was that there were about 67 down-regulated proteins and 147 up that we somewhat arbitrarily uh, divided into proteins that contributed to energy, synaptic structure, plasticity, metabolism, or transport, and then there was a small percentage that we did, there wasn't enough PubMed information to really um, um, categorize them. And then you go to the bioinformatics analysis, and by putting in those proteins that were important for plasticity, this network emerged. And what was really surprising, what the, the central node what, that was not surprising is that ERK popped up as a central node, so that's, that's uh, predictable from the literature, but then PBAR gamma is so closely associated. Now, this is not because of a bunch of literature, which is what IPA analysis depends upon, is PubMed hits for each of these proteins and their relationships that have been reported in the literature. This relationship emerges from uh, studies on uh, uh, adipos adiposity or adipogenesis, uh, diabetes, as well as cancer. Um, however, what is relatively new is that um, you know all the things that ERK are connected to also come back and connect to PPAR gamma. And the one thing that was very um, striking was that CREB binding protein, which I showed you in the previous slide as being uh, upregulated by rosiglitazone treatment uh, at the mRNA level, PPAR uh, CREB is also a hit in our um, proteomics analysis. And IP analysis places it between ERK and PPAR gamma, suggesting that CREB binding protein may actually be the interface between these two signaling cascades, these two transcriptional networks, uh, because CREB binding protein can not only partner with CREB, it also partners with PPAR gamma RXR, uh, PPAR gamma RXR um, uh, transcriptional complexes. And we're still investigating in cell culture approaches exactly how this um, may be regulated. Kelly? Mm-hmm. Um, has PPAR gamma, what's the relationship between PPAR gamma and ERK? Is it activating it or...? PPAR gamma is a substrate for ERK. Oh, yeah. And in, um, depending on the cell model, phosphorylation of PPAR gamma can be down-regulating, as, as it is in adipocytes, and another there's not that much literature as far as direct regulation, but another piece of evidence is that MEK has been uh, implicated as a nuclear cytosolic 
uh, transport for P par gamma. So if P par gamma is phosphorylated by ERK, then MEC will bind P par gamma and take it out of the nucleus. But we have no idea if that has any relevance to CNS or hippocampus. Uh-huh. I believe, again, that's a substrate target for ERK. And, um, you know, it's, it's, we had, it's, it's both synaptic structure and plasticity. And so uh, my guess is that ERK phosphorylation uh, regulates um, potentially synuclein activities that then affects synaptic vesicle fusion probabilities. I'm not an expert in that area, but um, and then so complexin two will come up later in my talk. Uh, we have we, we took the synaptic um, structure and plasticity proteins and we did another kind of a bioinformatics analysis and it implicated synaptic vesicle activities and so we have another little story that involves these guys here. But complexin 2 is, the, is thought to be a calcium sensor that um, causes or increases the probability of conformational changes of the vesicle machinery to allow lipid fusion. <coughs> so um, we, we clearly have overlap between the PPAR and ERK CREB uh, uh, systems. But you know, how does this really occur? And this is where Jordan comes in. And he uh, took on the project as Jennifer was finishing. And he really did some really outstanding animal behavior, biochemistry, and uh, protein chemistry uh, work. But one of the things that Jordan noticed was that if you look at binding motifs of ERK substrates, so these are motifs that are within targets of ERK phosphorylation. And if you look at the um, sequence of PPAR gamma, he found that um, at the right distances from the ERK phosphorylation site in P par gamma, there is a DEF and a D uh, motif contained within the P par gamma protein sequence. And if you have just the D site, you can be a, a substrate for ERK or junk. But if you also have a DEF site, you are now a much more specific target for ERK. And P par gamma contains both of these. So Jordan went ahead and did some recombinant protein GST studies in which he utilized uh, phospho-recombinant ERK with a GST recognition site at its amino terminus uh, in combination with recombinant PPAR. And what he found was with a fixed input of uh, ERK and increasing inputs of PPAR, he pulls down more PPAR. If uh, PPAR is absent, there's no signal for PPAR. If, um, PPAR is present, but there's no ERK, there's no PPAR, and there's no ERK, and et cetera. The interesting thing is uh, unphosphorylated recombinant ERK, under the same conditions, does not pull down PPAR. So ERK must be activated to be able to interact with PPAR in a GST pull down, suggesting that there is a regulatory relationship between the activation state of ERK, its ability to bind PPAR, and again, we don't know what the phosphorylation on PPAR under this, these circumstances actually does to all the rest of the work I'm about to show you. He also then went, went on to show that he could quantitatively and very reproducibly pull ERK, uh, I'm sorry, pull PPAR down with phospho-ERK antibodies in hippocampal homogenates, uh, specifically nuclear uh, extracts. So he's focusing now on all, all the rest of the data I'm going to show you is nuclear ERK, PPAR uh, complexes. So one of the things to try to convince the Alzheimer's field that you have any relevance to the disease is to show that whatever you're studying is affected in uh, AD, either pathologically, cognitively, or both. And this is what Jordan next did, was he did the IPs uh, targeting phospho-ERK, and then he uh, quantified how much PPAR came down with phospho-ERK. And he found that there was a significant uh, R-square correlation between the cognitive reserve of the AD sample and how much PPAR was able to come down with ERK. So suggesting that the better complex you have as an Alzheimer's patient, possibly, um, the more cognitive reserve you're going to have. There's 
kind of a ceiling effect as far as cognitive status in the control brains go, but still there was no direct relationship between ERK and PPAR. And he also tested this idea in our TG2576. So as on average, TGs don't freeze well in the context after fear conditioning training. But there are some TGs that freeze quite well, but there's those that freeze very poorly. And he found a similar correlational relationship in that the more PPAR that's pulled down when you target phospho-ERK, the better the animals uh, are freezing in our, uh, in our cognitive reserve tests, so to speak. And then again, there's really no relationship in the wild-type animals, suggesting that hippocampus-dependent cognition, um, <clears throat> at least in the TG2576 and possibly in Alzheimer's patients, is better when there's a more healthy protein-protein interaction between PPAR and phospho-ERK. So the next question Jordan asked was, what's going on with this complex during memory consolidation? Is the complex dynamically changing in quantity prior to training, immediately after training, or 24 hours? So he did a fairly difficult but critical experiment in which instead of uh, training the animals and then harvesting at 24 animal hours, he harvested the animals during this uh, approximate eight-hour window between, for, that we know is uh, important for ERK activation, Krebs gene transcription, and then memory consolidation. And so what he found was that <clears throat> the amount of PPAR that comes down with phospho-ERK does not change in wild-type animal. I'm sorry, these are all TGs. So the amount of uh, PPAR that comes down with phospho-ERK in TGs does not change with rosiglitazone treatment. Uh, I'm sorry, does not change with fear conditioning uh, in the absence of rosiglitazone. If the animals are treated with rosiglitazone, there's no statistical difference between this amount of complex. However, if you train the animals and they've been treated with rosiglitazone, there's a significant increase in the amount of PPAR that's associated with phospho-ERK during this uh, memory consolidation window. He then did the uh, GW reversal experiment, and he found that if, if all uh, the animals are trained, Rosiglitazone increases the complex, and uh, GW reverses that. GW and, uh, has no effect on uh, the complex in the absence of rosiglitazone, and then no real rosiglitazone doesn't do anything to the complex. So training increases it in the presence of rosiglitazone, and then there's no increase with the GW, even if the animals have been trained. And this is consistent with the work that Ro uh, Jennifer did, in which when she injects GW, and she waits 24 hours. Uh, this looks very much like the freezing behavior of, of a rosy versus GW treated animals. Okay, so uh, the working model that we came up with at this point was if rosiglitazone or other, some other PPAR gamma ligand is on board and you have a learning event that's supposed to activate ERK, this uh, complex coming together is facilitative to the type of gene transcription that's necessary for memory consolidation in the hippocampus. Um, clearly, PPAR and phospho-ERK are important. Because of the type of memory test we're using, we know that CREB and probably CREB binding protein are important. But this is still an open question if CREB binding protein is uh, coupling up. Hey, Beth? So the, the IPs are from total hippocampus? No, dentate, uh, I'm sorry, total hippocampus, but nuclear. We're um, trying to. We're doing immunohisto right now, and even attempting to do co-localization studies in different hippocampal region and discerning between glial versus neuronal. But we haven't. Yes, sir. We don't know if there's a shuttling event or not, and I can tell you that we've never seen a difference between. Um, we haven't seen changes in cytosol versus nuclear complex. Uh, like when we see the increase in the nuclear complex, we don't see a concomitant decrease in the cytosolic, but there's a lot more complex in the cytosol than there is in the nucleus, so we may not be able to see that, but we really don't have good evidence that there's actually a shuttling event occurring. We're on the, we're working with the model that there really isn't a shuttling event and that we're really just going to be focusing on the nuclear, the existing nuclear complexes. This is precedented by 
steroid receptor research in which estrogen receptors, progesterone receptors, they, they couple in and out with ERK2, and they also do that when they're sitting on the DNA, and there's never been a shuttling event implicated in that sort of dynamic in the transcriptional complex. So we're sort of modeling ourselves after estrogen and progesterone. Okay, so we have all this data from Larry's work, and then we have um, clearly uh, behavioral, biochemical, and protein-protein interaction uh, d uh, mechanism that suggests that this is an important phenomenon. So what do we do with all this uh, informatics data that's been generated through RNA and proteomics? And this is where um, uh, our collaborators Miroslav and Fernanda come in. Miroslav is an exceptionally talented electrophysiologist uh, who is working under the um, mentorship of Fernanda. And here we come back to our um, uh, dentate gyrus proteomics, and we find that um, many of the uh, synaptic vesicle fusion proteins uh, that work at the presynaptic membrane in the hippocampus, including other brain regions, uh, many of our uh, hits on the, uh, in the proteomics are represented by um, this, this neural network. So we put in our hits that are the blue uh, circled ones, blue and green. Wait a minute, I'm lost now. Okay, I think it's just the blue ones. But the blue ones all bring in several other, obviously, um, synaptic vesicle fusion proteins. And complexin-2 is a particularly intriguing one. And that is, like I said, it's the one that when calcium increases in the presynaptic membrane, it binds calcium. And this binding induces um, a conformational change that brings all the proteins into closer juxtaposition so that the, the, the activation energy for membrane fusion is now sufficiently decreased so that uh, vesicle fusion occurs and uh, neurotransmitter release can occur. So um, to be honest, this was a post-talk analysis after Miroslav did all this work, so, but I'm showing you it in backwards order, <laughs> just to make it, have it make sense a little bit. So what Miroslav did was he took the nine-month-old animals, either treated or untreated with rosiglitazone. So these are nine-month-old animals. This is not easy. And he did patch clamp recordings within the dentate gyrus um, and stimulated the perforant pathway, which is basically the axon bundle that comes from the medial and rhino cortex that is feeding all this spatial and contextual and sensory information into the dentate for the potential of you know, episodic or some kind of a memory trace to be established for um, memory formation. And so what he's asking is, what is the spontaneous uh, activity of these dentate gyrus uh, granule neurons under conditions of untreated nine-month-old TGs uh, uh, in comparison to rosiglitazone. And so he also did some evoked responses, which I'll get to in a minute. So if he just looks at spontaneous activity, in comparison to wild type, the nine-month-old TGs, you can clearly see more frequent uh, postsynaptic excitatory uh, currents. And I will tell you that every other neurotransmission is blocked except for glutamate. So these are glutamatergic uh, uh, receptor activations. And you can see that these are, the dentate granule neurons are clearly hyperexcitable in the TGs. And, the, and rosiglitazone uh, treatment appears to normalize this. If you do um, evoked activity in a, a paired pulse facilitation uh, test in which you're asking how much more inward current do we get uh, due to residual calcium when a second stimulus is uh, rapidly following a, a, the first one? And what you can clearly see here is that wild type and TGs look very different. The uh, first inward current, excitatory postsynaptic current, is much greater than wild types. However, the second one uh, is, is slightly larger, but not to the same ratio as the in the wild type or the TGs on Rosie. So again, TGs are hyperactive on the first one, but uh, clearly the amount of calcium that's remaining on the second stimulation is not of the same ratio metric uh, magnitude as in the wild types or the TGs after rosiglitazone treatment, which suggests a potential presynaptic mechanism due to calcium dysregulation. And if Miroslav does a probability of release analysis, 
he finds that the untreated TGs have a huge increase in the probability of presynaptic vesicle release that's normalized with uh, rosiglitazone. And if he does the readily releasable pool analysis, there is no significant difference between the groups suggesting that the number of vesicles or the amount of neurotransmitter in each vesicle is not altered in the genoty by genotype or by treatment, but it is the probability of release. So again, the uh, bioinformatics on the proteins identified in the dentate gyrus let a, you know, lead you to a presynaptic uh, hypothesis that then can be tested me mechanistically. This is the last example I'll give you. And this is uh, our, my current, one of my current students, uh, Ibdanello Cortez, who's kind of a sidekick of uh, Jordan's <laughs> in the lab and on the rugby field. Um, in that, another thing that was implicated in our bioinformatics analysis was neurogenesis. And if you take the, um, both the RNA and the proteomics hits in the, from the dentate, there are several uh, proteins that come out in that analysis that um, indicate uh, subgranular zone proliferation, circuit integration of new neurons, and then the maturation of those neurons within the granule cell layer. And again, uh, PPAR and ERK are central nodes in this network, suggesting that um, rosiglitazone may actually have uh, uh, an influence on this process. I won't go into very much detail, but we know that adult-born neurons contribute to hippocampal circuit function by way of um, being proliferating within the subgranular zone, and they, they, they go through a series of maturational stages. Um, initially, they have astrocytic markers being expressed, and uh, then they tr if they're going to become a neuron, they transition into expressing certain markers for neurons, in, uh, including um, nestin, double cortin, and then finally new N. As they're maturing, they're moving from this subgranular zone, and they're integrating themselves into the uh, granule cell layer of the dentate gyrus. And when, they're, when they first arrive, if they're, between, if they're less than six, between 30 and 60 days of age, they're much more excitable than the older neurons, older granule cells. And mainly, one, one hypothesis is that the um, GABAergic innervation within the um, molecular layer and hyalur layers of the, of the dentate, um, they're not quite as integrated into that circuit, so that they have less GABA inhibitory input and they're more excitable, which allows them to fire more readily to incoming input, which then contributes to a phenomenon Whoops, I missed a slide, I'm sorry. Which contributes to a phenomenon called um, context discrimination. So the relative abundance of uh, newborn neurons, e.g. 30 to 60 days, versus older granule cell neurons, the differential ratio between that population allows for better or worse uh, context discrimination, which is the ability to discriminate between two highly similar but different spatial, uh, spatial environments. I think I have a slide later. But. So based upon some other work that Miroslav did, he noticed that if you categorize um, the dentate gyrus granule cells in nine-month-old wild-type TGs and TGs on rosy, you find that there's a shift in the ratio of the um, uh, the mature to the immature neurons, such that in the wild type, you have a greater proportion of mature. TGs have less proportion, and TGs on rosy now, again, just like the electrophysiology, the behavior, and everything else, they are now, rosy glitazone treatment now um, converts the TGs looking more like a wild type. So Danny tested, uh, here's my context discrimination slide. So Danny tested the idea that um, based upon the bioinformatics on some of the protein and RNA hits, there might be a phenotype at the context discrimination level um, in which uh, neurogenesis and the maturation of adult-born neurons may be different between TGs and wild type, and rosiglitazone may have an effect on that. Here we go. I, we don't need this detail, but basically, already, um, this is some of the history where it, initially neurogenesis was identified by uh, Tridated thymidine incorporation, which was then followed by using BRDU incorporation to tag uh, 
newly generated neurons because if they're replicating DNA, they're going to incorporate either thymidine or BRDU uh, so that you can actually count new neurons and follow them as they mature by using these other markers that I mentioned, which is Nestin, double cortin, and Nguyen. We know that um, even in wild-type animals, enhancing adult neurogenesis through either <coughs> exercise, um, um, uh, environmental enrichment improves context discrimination or pattern separation task performance. However, decreasing adult neurogenesis either with gamma radiation or chemotherapy interventions impairs this performance. And we know that adult neurogenesis is disrupted in Alzheimer's brains. And um, there have been reports of dysregulated neurogenesis in uh, rodent models of AD. So context discrimination is, uh, is a fear conditioning based task. However, we're using two uh, similar but still distinct contexts. One context A is the shock context. Context B is the safe context. There's a training day on day zero in which all animals are put in context A and shocked. Then animals are pseudorandomly pseudo assigned on subsequent days to either context A first and B second or B first and uh, A second. And we're asking them, how many days does it take the animal to figure out that B is the safe context and A is, is still the um, shock context, such that they continue to freeze in A, but diminish their freezing in B, such that a discrimination ratio um, emerges in which the animals freeze significantly less in B and more in A. And Danny did a um, validation experiment in very young C57 uh, mice, and he showed that um, if you plot a percent freezing in uh, chamber A versus chamber B, then the animals continue to freeze in chamber A uh, by day three, or, or they can, they, in, excuse me, by day three, the animals are freezing more in, in context A than in context B. So in this experiment, context discrimination is evident at day three. They're not discriminating on day one or two. So this is something that has to be learned over time, at least in the, in the young C57s. If we do the same experiment in nine-month-old animals, we find that um, untreated animals, uh, somewhat uh, surprisingly, the untreated TG2576 context discriminated on day one and pretty much continued throughout the course of the experiment. Wild-type uh, nine-month-old animals did not context discriminate until day three. If you treat the wild-type animals with rosiglitazone, they continue to context discriminate throughout the experiment, and they're able to discriminate uh, by day two, suggesting that rosiglitazone is improving wild-type performance. However, rosiglitazone in TGs seems to be normalizing Again, just as we've shown all throughout this talk, rosiglitazone makes the TGs look more like a wild type in this uh, experiment than they do to the untreated TGs. Untreated TGs were able to discriminate by day one, and uh, how, in rosy treated animals, it shifted it by one day. This is a very subtle effect, I will admit. However, we, this was a very large cohort. Um, I think we had, we had 20 animals in each of the groups, so we had a total of 80 animals in this experiment, which is very, that's a very good power for a behavior experiment. Nonetheless, we are repeating this, and we're also doing gamma irradiation to uh, reverse the effect uh, that we saw, that we think we see in, in the untreated TGs. Nonetheless, Danny is now doing immunohisto on our four uh, genotype and treatment groups, and quantifying um, how many BRDU positive cells are present at, after 30 days? So he injects, he waits 30 days, he harvests, and he counts BRDU positive cells. And also, um, at the same time point, he's looking at how many, um, how many doc, uh, double cordon and new N positive cells are there. And the, this is a small N. Um, however, the trends appear to, to indicate that untreated animals and the rosiglitazone treated animals don't really have much uh, difference in how, much, how many uh, new N positive cells are surviving after 30 days of, uh, as indicated by BRDU. So they're co-positive for BRDU and new N. So they're born, they're 30 days old based on BRDU staining, 
but they're fully maturing to new end, positive cells based upon uh, the stain. However, if you look at untreated TGs uh, and you quantify the number of double cortin uh, positive cells in the granule cell layer, you'll notice that untreated TGs have a significantly higher amount of double cortin positive cells in the granule cell layer. Double cortin is an immature neuron marker. This suggests to us that the, incre the improved context discrimination may be due to a mechanism by which new neurons are born at pretty much the same rate as the wild type animals. However, the um, ones that are going, that are getting into the granule cell circuit are slightly less mature, i.e. more excitable than the wild type untreated. Rosiglitazone has an interesting effect. It increases the number of double cortin new end positive cells in the wild type animals and brings the TG2576 again into that wild type range. Where, as in contrast to previous experiments, Rosie is making uh, TGs look like rosy treated wild types, not like untreated wild types. So, this is the first example that we've ever seen where rosiglitazone is actually having an effect in our wild type cohort, which is pretty exciting because this suggests an aging dependent phenomenon and therefore why it broadens the applicability um, of, uh, of PPAR gamma agonism. Okay, just in summary, I think I've shown you that within a certain therapeutic window, PPAR gamma agonism can enhance hippocampus dependent cognition. This is through the induction and or normalization of genes and proteins within the dentate. I've shown you some pre and post synaptic mechanisms as well as some evidence for circuit level remodeling that's reflected in uh, a cognitive task. And these are all of our collaborators. Uh, Larry and I work quite closely together uh, on this project, but um, you know, as headed by you know, Jordan specifically and Jennifer, and now by Danello. Uh, we also have some other uh, projects in the lab that are, uh, have been uh, initiated by Ryan Miller, who's now graduated, but now Andrea, this is our cocaine self-administration PPAR gamma agonism project, which um, I didn't have time to talk about today. Obviously, Fernanda and Julio, who was my collaborator on the calcineurin work. Thank you for your attention. We've tried that, and we didn't see any benefit at nine months of age, but if you give it to 12 to 13 month old animals, it improves the contextual fear conditioning. We haven't tested anything else, um, but it doesn't do it all the way to wild type levels. It brings them about halfway, but we haven't tried any combination therapy yet. Mm -hmm. That's sort of a follow-up question. What's the evidence? Well, that could be part of the story, but clearly synaptic structural and functional proteins are part of the story too. And I, I don't know of any evidence that insulin signaling impinges upon synaptotagmin or syn synuclein or anything like that. But clearly these are genes that are regulated at the transcriptional level by PPAR and or maybe ERK, CREB. But um, I don't know that insulin directly impinges upon plasticity genes, although insulin will contribute to synaptic plasticity under certain experimental conditions. And there is insulin, nasal, intranasal insulin clinical trial is taking place. And, and that's, a, that's a very, I mean, that makes logical sense to me that that might help, you know, a certain subset of patients. Decrease the function of synapses and also uh, improve the uh, neurogenesis. <laughs> Research similar mechanism doing this for. I don't know. <laughs> I really don't. So, so the, the interesting, so this is something I didn't really emphasize. Acute GW pretty much kills the cognitive enhancing properties of PPAR. So four hours prior to training, if you give the GW PPAR antagonist, you, you, you wipe out the beneficial cognitive effects of PPAR agonism. 
I don't think GW is reversing all the structural and metabolic things that are happening. So one thing that we, I don't know, I'm, so one thing that may be, ha one, it may be multi-layered. So PPAR may be changing the landscape, but PPAR and ERC are also a very important component that, that utilizes that landscape. So, and I'm not sure that acute ROSI may not do what 30 days of ROSI is doing. So we may need both. We may need to activate PPAR to get to ERC, but we also have to change the structural and functional landscape so that when they do come together or that they can come together, they're doing their job with CREB and the nuclear transcriptional activity. On the move on, the newer degeneration you campus, well, so this animal model at this age does not exhibit significant neurodegeneration. Uh, there's a little bit of synapse loss at this age. We have not counted synapses since after the rosy treatment. But um, my prediction would be that we probably would see a, a, an improvement. So, uh, could you show that in the TG2576 might show that deficiency in context uh, Fear condition, but not in acute fear condition, right? Is that a, uh, a do the other APP models show the same mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So Yes. So always do the complex fear condition develop earlier than the. None of them, there's very few instances of acute fear conditioning being affected in any of these models. Um, all fear conditioning is amygdala dependent. Associating a fearful stimulus with a context or a spatial environment is hippocampus dependent. So the fact that they're, though they're okay in the queued in a novel environment means that they, the auditory stimulus, which is being processed in a hippocampus independent manner to the amygdala, that circuit's intact. It's just when you ask the hippocampus to remember the contextual cues in this training paradigm, the animals are impaired. One other interesting and, and sort of complexity layer to add is TGs are not impaired in foreground conditioning. So if you don't have the auditory stimulus and you're not driving their circuit to, to consider an auditory stimulus in, 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 at the same time as contextual information, they're fine. So if you get rid of the auditory stimulus, they freeze to the same extent as wild type animals. It's when the auditory stimulus and they're forced to do background fear conditioning where the auditory stimulus is competing for the contextual cues, the hippocampal circuit breaks down somehow. So the circuit or the communication from sensory information to the, from the auditory cortex to the amygdala seems to divert the contextual information when you, do the, when you train the animals in that particular way. If you get rid of auditory, they're fine. They can put all the cues together and they, they remember the context. Which was, was confusing to us at first because if they're good at, in context discrimination, why are they better? But we thought the only thing that's really different is that there's no auditory cue. So context discrimination utilizes that foreground fear conditioning approach, and which allows me to my, bend my mind around the fact that TGs that are bad at background fear conditioning can actually be better in foreground fear conditioning when there's a context discrimination complexity added on to the difficulty of the test. Now, I have a follow-up question on that. So, actually, uh, you know, the, um, the experiment that you uh, referred to in the J20, when we follow that one, uh, mm -hmm. because the J20 is also part of the continuous neurogenesis. So, I'm, I'm wondering if this is something that you have essentially, you know, um, Investigated the mechanisms a little bit more, more you know, with, with more right. and essentially you find something that has to do with amyloid beta stimulating neural progenitor because that's what we found. Right? Well, Hui Zhang has that paper from last year where I think when they got rid of APP, yes. they lost exactly. neurogenesis or they had impaired mm -hmm. neurogenesis. Yes. There's actually a paper, and we're, we're trying to repeat those findings, that if you do acute BRDU like um, 24 hours, mm -hmm. TGs actually take up more than wild types. And the other but what we're showing here, after 30 days, there's no, there's no difference in survival. So, oh. so it, it seems like they produce, they, make, they, make way, they may make more neur neuron or cells acutely, not, all, not the same 
fraction don't survive as wild types. However, the maturation process is distinctly different between wild types and TGs. Okay. So it's not explained. So you can't I don't think it's explained just by producing ner or cells. It's a, there's a maturation plus production okay. thing going on. So if the maturation is delayed, does that affect the survival? That I don't know, but it certainly affects excitability. Yeah. Well, I wonder whether the effect of um, of brosiglitazone to promote the interaction with Eric and the PPAR, is, is that dependent upon the presence of insulin? No, or is this the drug enhancing ins the effect of insulin, or would it we don't know, but that's something we can get out with our cell culture model, and you know, so we can manipulate all those things where I don't think we really can in the animal. But yeah, that's another question, and it and we actually it's on the grocery list, so it's it'll we're gonna do it. <laughs> well, thank you. That was fun.